20th century, modernism beyond the binary of East and West, with, which is, of course, a crucial issue, um, as we all know. And um, I would like to introduce the next uh, moderator, although um, if there's someone who doesn't need an introduction, it's probably him, uh, Professor Dr. Jörg Haspel. Um, let me give you a short outline of his <laughs> uh, biography. Um, he graduated in architecture and urban planning in Stuttgart and in history of art and cultural studies in Tübingen in 1981. He then became a custodian of the inventory department um, of the Monument Protection Authority in Hamburg before he then came um, to Berlin, because this is the role that most of us know him um, from 1992 until 2018. He was the state uh, curator of historic monuments, so the Landeskonservator and the director of the Landesdenkmalamt Berlin Monument Authority. And also a second uh, important issue is from 2012 to 2021, he was president of ICOMOS Germany. And he's also um, chairing the board of trustees of the German Foundation for Monument Protection, Deutsche Stiftung Denkmalschutz. And he is a permanent member of the expert group of urban heritage conservation of the federal government in Germany and a founding member of the international scientific uh, ICOMOS Committee of 20th Century Heritage Preservation. He teaches as a honorary professor in heritage conservation at Technical University in Berlin. And um, his research and publication activities are quite broad, but also focus on modern built heritage and urban heritage um, in metropolises. He's a member, this is probably in our case also important, of the action group Dissonant Heritage in partnership with the culture, cultural heritage and urban agenda of the European Union. Jörg, you can introduce the topic. Thank you very much for this um, fine introduction, which was uh, summarizing all um, online information you could collect, I think. Uh, maybe I can correct it later, because some of them are outdated. But th thank you very, very much here. Um, I was asked to uh, guide the second section on how it was called Iron Curtain, Iron Curtains in the 20th Century Modernism Beyond binary of east and west or of east or west uh, to today. And I think this, it's a very fine place to do this here at the Pariser Platz close to the Brandenburg Gate because it was mentioned in the, in the morning already. It is only, let's say, 100 or 200 meters from here that Ronald Reagan in 1987 had the uh, his speech in front of the Brandenburg Gate on the western side, in front of the, of the Iron Curtain, and he said, dear Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate, tear down this wall, and two years later it, um, it happened. It, it happened and it wasn't seen. So we are very close to the former Iron Curtain and this site where we are, there was nothing, everything was demolished, it was only the Academy of Fine Art on the opposite side with some relics of the old buildings and here was, you can call it something like no man's land and today we will discuss the relationship between east and west of the Iron Curtain or of the Iron uh, Curtains. And I think it's interesting, we have uh, about six presentations you can see here, and I think there are eight speakers and ten authors who are responsible for the next uh, session who will attend us, which uh, uh, will discuss the Iron Curtain. And we will do this from the, not in, not in front or, or behind of the Iron Curtain, but from the eastern side of the Iron Curtain. All the speakers are from the east of the Iron Curtain, and will reflect how the Iron Curtain can be, um, how it can be overcome, how it can be related to the West, and how was the perception in the West. And I would like to start with uh, Blasey Tsiolkovsky, who is here. Ah, thank you. Um, 
He did his uh, Master of Science and PhD in Architecture at Lodz University, and he is also Master of uh, Arts in the History of Art at the University of Lodz. He is an Associate Professor at the Institute of Art History, and now he is Assistant Professor at the Institute of Architecture and Urban Planning in Lodz University, and he is um, um, author of many articles, books, and also uh, was responsible for exhibitions. So one of them is the ambiguous legacy of socialist modernist architecture in Central and Eastern Europe, or the architect's word. And this leads us to his presentation, I think, the architect's word narratives on the architecture of socialist Poland. He also was included, or he was the Polish representative and responsible for the Innova Concrete project, which was in 2018 about uh, concrete architecture and concrete heritage in Europe, which was funded by the EU, which was a project, and I think Poland was involved with the with Wroclaw, with the Centennial Hall, as well as the um, train station in, in, in Warsaw. It was one of the main uh, aspects there. His current research focused on post-war modernist architecture in totalitarian and authoritarian systems, and he is member of Dokomomo and of ECOMOS as well. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Professor Haspel, for the great introduction. Uh, well, I would like to focus on the way architects, Polish architects from the times of socialism, describe their international experience. Uh, so let's start with the Iron Curtain. Uh, the picture is quite confusing because we have uh, Winston Churchill taking a look at the eastern side, while I will be talking about Polish architects who did the same from the other way, from the other side. So uh, architectural histori uh, historian David Crowley uh, once named the Iron Curtain a nylon curtain, which means it was a semi-transparent uh, barrier when uh, a lot, but not everything, can be, can be seen. Uh, what does it mean? That after the Stalinist period, after 1956, uh, the um, Iron Curtain was, well, a little bit unveiled. Yet it uh, still existed and there was still this war between East and West. But after uh, this, let's say, political and social change in 1956, uh, Polish architects, as one of the few uh, professional groups, was allowed to uh, almost freely visit Western countries. Even uh, architect Professor Andrzej Basista mentioned that as a professional group, architects, besides other men of arts, uh, became those who traveled abroad most frequently. Uh, but when we uh, talk about international experience of uh, socialist Polish architects, we have to face many myths, many urban legends. Among them, those uh, who say that only architects who are members of the party uh, were uh, able to go abroad, which is not true. Uh, gossips that uh, uh, those study visits or any contacts with uh, the capitalist West resulted in copy and paste uh, activities of Polish architects. Uh, so we have uh, quite a lot of uh, popular myths. We have, uh, in fact, really little to do with the reality. And our knowledge about those mutual relations between uh, Polish socialist architecture and uh, West is uh, mostly based, of course, on uh, journals, books, including personal diaries, documents like uh, all the uh, passport papers and so on, when we, where we have all the destinations mentioned and justified. But we also have oral history. And this is uh, especially interesting uh, for me because we have to face the memory of architects, which is subjective, with some uh, treat as not valuable because of this uh, lack of objectivity, but which, because of the same reasons, is very, very interesting because we don't have 
one uh, history written with the capital H letter. We have many histories, personal histories, with the small H letter in the beginning. So we have the situation where the fact of travel is undeniable and it's objective, but the impact on the architect and uh, architecture is subjective, is uh, negotiable. Uh, very first uh, excursion, uh, excursion, very first travel abroad uh, after the end of uh, Stalinist era, or at the end of Stalinist era, in fact, took place in 1955 and uh, selected a group of individuals uh, visited uh, Italy, visited uh, France, visited Sweden. Here we've got the uh, relation of Stanisław Spyrt, architect from Krakow, who uh, went to Italy because his uh, chief in City Project Krakow uh, selected him and designated him to go abroad. And what was the result of this trip? Uh, many memories, some pictures, and this building designed in 1956, which, in my opinion, and I hope you agree with me, uh, presents very strong uh, impact of Italian rationalism. Uh, because when Polish architects came back from those excursions, they frequently uh, prepared some uh, lectures, open lectures, for their colleagues or for people in general. They uh, prepared articles, and they hardly uh, re uh, recalled modern architecture. They mostly focused on historical buildings. So we have to search for those inspirations uh, comparing architecture designed after the excursion with uh, assets they have seen. Here we've got uh, individual, uh, the history of individual uh, trip around Europe of Daniel Olenski and his friend, acoustic technician, Jerzy Guminski. They visited, for example, Düsseldorf. And uh, Jerzy Guminski, because Olenski is already dead, Guminski told me that they were really fascinated with the uh, concert house in Düsseldorf. And what was the result? Well, we cannot say that it's a direct uh, attempt to uh, implement German uh, solutions in Poland. However, some technical solutions, some spatial design solutions are quite comparable. Uh, Jadwiga grabowska havrylak was one of the really, really uh, few architects who admitted openly that they were inspired by what they have seen abroad. Uh, she spent her holidays in Golden Sands in Bulgaria, and when she was designing, few, few days later, when she was designing uh, Grunwaldski's work complex in Wrocław, she wanted to uh, implement the impression of white concrete uh, buildings with some greenery, with some vegetation, uh, just like the ones she, has, uh, uh, she had seen in Bulgaria. Well, the re reality was quite different. The concrete in Wrocław was not white, but gray, no vegetation, and no dark wood cladding she wanted to implement. However, she admitted that there was some, some inspiration. Uh, we have also some study visits organized and financed by the state or by the employees, which were supposed to provide architects with certain knowledge about latest technologies, about uh, certain typologies of architecture. And for example, we have two architects from Łódź, uh, from my hometown, uh, Bolesław Kardaszewski, who prepared the design of the university campus in Łódź, and he visited Nitra in Czechoslovakia, nowadays Slovakia, and Heidelberg in Germany, whereas his colleague Wyżnikiewicz, when he was designing an enormous hospital dedicated to Polish women in Łódź, uh, was sent to Germany and also to Sweden, when, where uh, he uh, assisted or just uh, saw the operation. So they made uh, some international uh, contacts. They were trying to um, take a look at what's going on behind the Iron Curtain and then implement the certain solutions in socialist Poland. Uh, the authorities were uh, quite aware of the propaganda potential of modernist 
architecture. That's uh, why they were uh, eager to send architects abroad, give them uh, money, uh, some, some, some of money to, to complete it. And uh, for example, Arseniusz Romanowicz, when uh, he and Piotr Szymania uh, designed a central station in, in Warsaw, they uh, visited Italy, France, Switzerland, comparing some uh, railway stations, but also uh, they, I guess, went uh, somewhere on the top of the mountain in Switzerland, in Alps, just to see that uh, some escalators can work in very, very hard weather conditions. Uh, and uh, Bogdan Wyborek, who was an urban planner in Warsaw, uh, justified his application to receive the passport and go abroad as uh, the need to analyze the good examples and implement in Poland. So he asked the authorities to let him go to Germany, to Berlin and to Czechoslovakia to uh, take a look at metro stations. Uh, another group and another type of uh, uh, contacts with the uh, Western architecture was uh, were the architects who worked abroad, and uh, they worked in different different countries. We have uh, two examples here: Marek Budzyński, who worked in Denmark, and then he came to Poland, came back to Poland, and designed uh, large housing estates in, in Warsaw. In Warsaw, same Jakub Wujek who uh, created a housing estate in, in Łódź. Uh, it's quite difficult to find direct uh, inspirations or direct connections between Danish or Finnish architecture and those housing estates. However, the way both of them were, are, were thinking about architecture was somehow different than it used to be common in Poland those days. Because uh, those uh, study visits or the possibility of working abroad inspired architects not only to copy and uh, certain solutions, not only to implement certain technologies, but also to think about architecture, to think about uh, work of architect in totally different way. And Romuald Legler, who worked in Vienna in the beginning of 1970s, told me that uh, for him, it was eye-opening that the way of designing uh, can never end, that it's an open creative process and all, all the time something can be changed and developed and so on. And that was what he wanted to implement after coming back to huge uh, stay owned by the state architectural office in Krakow and he didn't manage to. By the way, we have three pictures here, two of them are uh, were made in Polish architectural office and the top uh, right hand one was taken in Vienna. They look more or less the same, but the way architects worked was totally, totally different. And uh, in my opinion, one of the most interesting uh, ideas or reflections after the journey, the one by Czesław Bielecki, who worked in France but he traveled around the Europe. He also visited uh, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. He went to Israel. And he came back from this journey as an anti-modernist architect. He came back as a total enemy of modernist architecture and modernist urban planning because he said that he saw those buildings which were totally the same in France, in uh, Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv and uh, had nothing to do with local climate, local tradition. Of course, we can uh, have our own, own opinion, but that was kind of a formative journey for Bielecki, who became one of the most important postmodern architects in Poland later. Uh, and uh, I'm, coming, I'm uh, slowly, slowly coming to the, to the end. We have uh, the same ideas of very, very similar ideas which were created in Poland and in Western uh, Europe without any direct contact. So, Stefan Miller, who uh, created some interesting buildings and even more interesting theoretical concepts, uh, admitted that he had no contact with Western ideas, 
I don't believe it personally. Uh, but he claimed that his ideas were born just the same, uh, uh, just as those ideas were born in other countries. It was the coincidence, according to him. And when we take a look at Jonas Friedman, Paul Maimon, and Jan Gushak's concepts, they look more or less the same, the same ideas of futuristic megastructures. And this is megastructure created by Stefan Miller, uh, who uh, described his uh, meeting with uh, Japanese uh, architect, Japanese designer, uh, Takayama, that they met. And they started laughing because they created the same concept without knowing each other. So according to Miller, there was a pure, pure coincidence. And uh, this opinion was somehow confirmed by Oscar Hansen, who uh, said that uh, there is a specific ambience, the atmosphere, the spirit, and uh, those concepts, this type of concepts, uh, are a result of this creative spirit all over the world, but not a simple copy-paste activity. Well, uh, once again, I have to put a question mark here because we have two pictures, Oscar Hansen and Siam meeting, and Oscar Hansen and Team X meeting. So he had very, very close relations with Western thought about architecture, Western ideas, and uh, uh, put in Treating everything as a coincidence is, in my opinion, a little bit of simplification, oversimplification. But nevertheless, uh, just to make a short, short resume, uh, instead of becoming a detective and investigating who copied who, uh, we can think it slightly, slightly different. Uh, I would like to once again quote Andrzej Basista, who said that he was a child of the age uh, when people loved to ask who was first, who copied who, Miss copied Johnson or Johnson copied Miss, and this is a this is pointless. So instead of uh, searching for this copy paste uh, activity and its results, we should maybe think uh, about it as a exchange of ideas. And this is a very nice picture of uh, Christina Krieger architecture laws in Venice. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. In your abstract, you mentioned that you do not trust in architecture, not in articles, not in archives, but on oral history. And my question is, the examples you brought here, where are the sources? Is it, did, you, did you ask them? Did you do interviews? Or what, what, what kind of sources did you use for this comparison? Uh, OK, uh, so uh, except uh, one, except the quotation uh, of Oscar Hansen, all of the uh, quotations, all of the opinions of architects uh, were gathered uh, by myself during the uh, interviews. So I made like 50 interviews with architects uh, who worked in uh, during the times of socialism, and I asked them about the international experience. That's why I'm putting sometimes a question mark, because, well, it's their, it's their own subjective version of history. It's not the objective one. No, it, it, I, I think it's very interesting to this kind of rehabilitation of oral history and of personal and direct uh, interviews. Thank you very much for the presentation. And the, the presentation was on the title, I forgot to uh, quote the title, Looking Through a Nylon Curtain, How Do Architects Describe Their International Experience in Times of Socialism? And this was the perspective which was presented here uh, by Blase Sharkovsky. The next speaker is Helena Huber. Dudova, she is, ah, that's you. Uh, she is the curator at the architecture collection of the National Gallery in Prague. So she came from Czech Republic. She completed her PhD in art history at the University of Zurich. And she is the co-lead of the Czech Science Foundation research project on women in architecture after 1945. 
Um, she's a commissioner of the Czech representation at the 18th International Architecture Exhibition, and there she also created the exhibition No Demolition, Forms of Brutalism in Prague. It was in 2020, I think. And um, Architecture for Socialist Cities and Active Citizenship in Central Europe in Rotterdam in 2019. And the Modern Woman Architect, the Projection and Reality in Central Europe. She will give a paper on the typology of architecture practice between East and West and is asking, um, is anonymous typified and prefabricated architecture, does it exist or is it created without architectures or are masterpieces of, creative, of a creative genius and what have the most significant modes of architecture practice in the 20th century in Europe and in the United States? Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hasper, for your kind introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear everyone in, in case I speak too, um, uh, too not loud enough, then just tell me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm honored to present here at the Pilecki Institute uh, at this conference like between East and West. I hope my uh, my presentation will fit into the perspective uh, because I was kind of like thinking about the comparisons of the East and the West. Uh, that's why I was uh, kind of drawing this daring thesis uh, that uh, focuses uh, on the professional organization of architecture practice on a typology. Uh, and I was kind of thinking about um, the organization structure uh, of the master architect, the bureaucratic office, and different collectives and uh, experimental forms of practices, as well as women uh, who entered the profession, which was like an intersecting element uh, that happened in parallel in, in the East and the West. Um, yeah. so, uh, so the professional role of, uh, of the architect in the 20th century, uh, his task and the organization, as well as the notion of authorship, um, have been shifting in relation to the societal and the technological uh, changes. Uh, building has become too complex to be authored by one person. Um, the technical aspects of large-scale commissions uh, brought in her in inherently the engineer expert into the design process. Uh, as I mentioned, women were entering the workforce, the political and ideological divisions of the Cold War, socialist and capitalist systems, and the search for the new, more horizontal models of practice brought, uh, brought about a more diversified professional landscape. Um, if we look um, at the, at the like, theoretical, historical introduction of the professional practice, I was very surprised that there are very few, actually, um, there's one major work by uh, Winfried Nerdinger, uh, which is called The Architect, History and Presence of the Profession. Um, and he advises us to study the architect uh, before we uh, study architecture. Um, Nerdinger predominantly focuses on the figure of the architect genius. Um, an architect is a creative individual and a subject of canonization uh, and historiogra historiographical encounter. Uh, he recollects the myth of Daedalus, uh, who was considered the inventor, a technician, and master craftsman, and a model for a figure of an architect. Um, and and of, of course, uh, historians of architecture have uh, predominantly focused on the development of biographies, which was the most common way of canonization of architects and, and uh, architecture works. Um, in contrast to that, uh, the author Dana Kaff, uh, in her introduction, Architecture, the Story of Practice, focuses on the everyday uh, knowledge, pays attention to the working hierarchies and cultures, shared values, and professional roles. She considers four my, uh, main dialectical dualities of the profession between the individual and the collective, uh, between art, uh, architecture as art and architecture as business or administration, uh, between design as the decision making and design as making sense of a situation, and finally uh, between the dichotomy between the generalists and specialists. And these uh, three dichotomies I kind of productively used to 
uh, to create like this typology of the master architect, the bureaucratic office, and the more horizontal collective model of practice, uh, which as I try to argue, was uh, developing in parallel in the East and the West. Uh, uh, so, so if we look at the uh, uh, architect uh, as a master designer, the most established professional figure was Le Corbusier, uh, and he was like an epitome of a modernist master with a distinct signature, which we even see uh, bit, uh, underneath uh, his, um, his portrait. Um, and then uh, we see on the upper right uh, also a, a view of his office. Uh, office Le Corbusier was located in Paris. It was an open studio with lines of drawing boards arranged one behind the other that demonstrated cooperation, but also the presence of the chef of the atelier in the mural at the face side uh, of the office. There is, there is like a mural um, which everyone was actually like quasi uh, looking at. Um, and, uh, and there was an administration room uh, for Le Corbusier at the entrance of the office and, uh, and also later on like a separate study room. That means that the, the master architect was actually a part of the studio, but actually he did have a spatially separated uh, um, uh, yeah, shelter or, or kind of like spaces. Um, here you see also the caricature of, of the master architect uh, with his villa, you know, like a signature piece. Um, and, and these caricatures are actually taken from, from the Czech journals uh, of architecture from uh, the 50s and 60s. Uh, I just want to demonstrate that uh, like the, the work of Le Corbusier was like quite present also in the socialist journals from the 60s, uh, including all of his works, like the uh, city for the three million uh, of persons like the Pavillon uh, Les Prix Nouveau uh, from Paris 1925 or the Plan Boisin as well as uh, Philips Pavilion, uh, Roncham, La Tourette. So it means that uh, like as, as there was like this argument with the Nylon Curtain, I think it, it's uh, perfectly uh, correct because the professional journals in the East did, re uh, did have the, quite an intensive reception of uh, um, yeah, of, of Western architecture. Um, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, and it was probably like different in different times and in different lands. Like in, in Czech, like this real liberal period was the 60s. Um, then, then another epitome of, of the uh, master architect uh, after the Second World War is the star architect. Um, the, the star architect was, bought, uh, was born um, in the neoconservative era of the 1980s uh, with like this uh, economic growth. Uh, the Time magazine from, uh, from January 1979 devote, devoted its cover to Paul Johnson uh, as an individual creator uh, holding a model of his recent skyscraper design. Uh, the, architect, uh, the, the article presents Johnson as a maverick designer an unfun terrible of architecture. Um, Johnson then, later on, in the same year, 1979, be, became the first recipient of the Pritzker Prize. Uh, and the Pritzker Prize actually became the mark of the star architect. Johnson uh, was actually running a corporate office, uh, but was only portrayed as an artist. Uh, so the artistic uh, autonomy, autonomy of the star architect and also his like uh, star architect signature uh, was even strengthened by the first Venice Architecture Biennale entitled The Presence of the Past, curated by Aldo Rossi. Uh, and and of obviously like this autistic aura is in a way also antithetical to collaborative work. Um, as, uh, as an addition, I want to say that like this star or um, master architect's position was not that common in Central and Eastern Europe uh, between 45 and 89, uh, as the role of the architect was specified as a collective uh, activity and collective interest ranked higher than the individual ones. Uh, 
uh, collective interest ranked higher. Only very few uh, figures established master studios. These were exceptional, uh, like the Meisterwerkstatt of the German, uh, East German Building Academy in the 1950s of uh, Hermann Henselmann, uh, Richard Paulik, uh, and Hans Hopp. Or similarly in Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, this master studio was run by Jiří Kroha, who also uh, took over like propaganda and representative outputs of the socialist state. Um, the second model is the bureaucratic office uh, or the corporate office. Um, so in 1947, uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock ventured a uh, prognosis um, that uh, the bureaucratic office uh, would become the predominant mode of architectural production after the Second World War. Uh, the other mode of production was, was this like master uh, studio. Um, the bureaucratic offices were large-scale architecture organizations from which personal expression was absent. Uh, meaning that's like completely antithetical to this like authorship uh, master discourse. Um, Hitchcock saw the office of Albert Kahn uh, as the predecessor of a, of a bureaucratic company. Kahn's firm realized industrial plans, complete, completing about 1,000 commissions for Henry Ford in Detroit between 1920s and 1930s. Um, the main feature of the office work was a horizontal fast track design approach that bypassed the traditional vertical hierarchy between the author to draftsperson to, to consultant to contractor, but it's, it, uh, it provides specialized units dealing with work execution, like office management, administration, construction management, which you can see like on this like organizing scheme in different departments, meaning that it was not that every architect would like, you know, go through the whole process, but you would like simply like parts of the design process like follow in a, in a horizontal way, you know, like from from design to industrial plans to, detail, to details, and this would become like in a, in a way this uh, Taylorism method of, uh, yeah. Um, so this was championed by the, uh, by the corporate office uh, after the Second World War. Um, for instance, uh, in the, Skidmore, uh, Owings, and Merrill, uh, Merrill office, um, which merged American methods and uh, progressive modernist design into the international style. Um, in the post-war period, more flexible methods than like this Taylorism of, of Henry Ford uh, were employed, and these were based on the Drucker's uh, hierarchical teamwork model, uh, which included like uh, flexible feedback loops uh, you can see also like uh, architects working in a group uh, on on these models, and you can also see these prefabricated like there is like this one model, uh, it's like a model mock-up, um, and and also a, min, uh, a montage um, of an administration steel company. So actually, it, it demonstrates that. Uh, there was like not a single piece of architecture, but like this uh, architecture was standardized and typified, and um, and was 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 actually put together like on a kind of like montage uh, line. Um, then then now this is like the tricky one, uh, so I would uh, uh, I would maybe uh, claim that. Um, uh, the bureaucratic office was also present in the East, um, in the state, uh, state projects institutes. Um, uh, but it was more of a collective model um, because the ownership uh, structure uh, was turned from private to socialist, uh, including building, and the state became the only commissioner uh, in Central and Eastern European countries. Um, and. Uh, Architects were newly active in state-owned project institutes, um, and the commissions were subjected to economic planning and not the free market model. In in uh, in, in these like project institute structure, uh, here you can see like the founding of the Stubble project, which was like 
one state project office, which at like some point uh, had like up to 11,000 employees in the mid 1950s. But normally, like the state project institute had the size of about 600 people. Um, at the height of the like largest corporate uh, American company, the uh, TAC, um, the Architects Collective by Gropius had 400 architects, and like like a regular regular state uh, state project company in the east had like about 600 uh, 600 persons which also included uh, in a way the specialists and so on so uh, so you have to see that that there is like some kind of uh, likeness of the scale of this bureaucratic office which also includes like a, a great deal of management mm. Um, what is interesting in, in, in Czechoslovakia was that um, that uh, like this this photo of of the office uh, is was is, is from Zlín, the Gotwaldov, and actually that is like the city that was like uh, uh, built as a factory city by Batya, uh, and and also like the uh, the architect who was um, who was active with the Batya company. Uh, who is like super well known for Fordism uh, in, in production, was then the first uh, director of the Stavo project, like of the first state office. So he really did implement these like Taylorism methods in this early Stavo project in, in Czechoslovakia. Um, one also has to see the image on the right uh, that this like collective principle played a role on multiple levels. It was pitched ideologically against capitalist architecture, the product of free market, individual bourgeois creativity, and the search for unique artistic solutions in the West was contrasted with the role of the architect who optimizes uh, the living processes and positive relationships in society and integrates his or work, uh, her work in, in collective processes. Um, one could also, like that's a little bit my invention, could speak about uh, maybe a collective signature in some studios uh, that there was like not, not this like individual signature. Some studios might have uh, developed a collective signature, um, which uh, like colleagues who were uh, working on a on a on a GDR research project called Das Kollektiv, they claimed this collective signature were, was, for instance, present in the studio of Hans Grafundel, who was also uh, one of the art, uh, authors of the um, of the Palace de la République. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then uh, the third model, uh, these like I said, uh, horizontal uh, experiments and collective experiments. Uh, this one is. Uh, I mean, there was a growing number of visionary collectives of the 1960s, like Archigram, Superstudio, Archizoom, and Hans Ruckerko, uh, that strove to rethink architecture from the open perspective. Uh, then there was, for instance, this practice-oriented model um, of uh, Atelier 5 uh, from, from Zurich, uh, which was quite well known for its brutalist architecture. Uh, I, I chose like two examples uh, of practice-oriented collectives. One was from Hungary, this Mischkoltz workshop that was active between 1979 and 1989. It was 20 young graduates of the Political University in Budapest uh, who selected this industrial town uh, to start uh, their communal life after university. The experiment was facilitated by, facilitated by the North Hungarian Planning Office and the group was offered work and lodging. They created a collective house from typified elements, um, which you can see like the floor plan, you can see um, left bottom, on the bot in the bottom, and, and the typified collective house then to the, to the right. Um, so the usual 54 square meter apartment floor space was divided into 30, 36 square meters for private use and then 18 square meters for collective use. It also offered a community room, uh, a roof terrace, a workshop, laundry room, and a photo lab. So it was like a communal house we know from nowadays. Um, uh, the horizontality of the group was expressed by the equality in the living spaces and common statues of the Timpanon Association. Um, the collective was a framework for a voluntary community, about 35 inhabitants. And in addition to that, there was a, an architecture projection office uh, with this 
northwestern Hungarian um, uh, SARC TEF uh, uh, planning, sta state planning office, uh, and, and this like architects collective was actually under the guidance of Saba Bodoni and Isvan Ferenc, uh, then really building uh, building houses and medical centers and schools. Um, Another semi-independent uh, commune community was the Czechoslovak Sial uh, Association of Architects and Engineers in Liberec, uh, who were successful in the field of high-tech architecture, uh, winning uh, uh, the well-known is winning the award prize, winning August Perry Prize, a hotel and TV transmitter tower on the Ještět Mountain in Liberec, uh, you see on the uh, upper right. Um, his, it, his author, Kaler Hubáček, the leading architect, likened the work of the studio to a laboratory. Um, and uh, you see to the left uh, the Sial kindergarten, the Školka Sial, an incubator of machinist thought and advanced teamwork, which was founded in 1969. It was like a postgraduate program of like young uh, graduates after school who actually came from Prague to Liberec to have like this sort of communal experience and not to dis uh, divide between life and work. Um, they they started uh, living in this restaurant Najedlove, which is here, and and the fo floor plans also uh, reflects the organization of uh, of the of the place. Um, that here is the studio, uh, and then there is like this living cells. And, uh, and you can see there's like one big living space and shared, shared amenities, shared uh, rooms uh, for living actually and uh, you know, um, celebrating also sports. This is how the studio looked like. They were also playing basketball uh, in, this, in this studio and it was like uh, they were having musical festivals and so on. Um, so, and, and the, the last but not least, as I said, there are parallels uh, uh, to like the role of women, women in architecture in, in, in the West and the East. So like the common parallel, or as Agnes Heller and also Mary Papchinsky recently discovered, uh, the, the, both of the systems were actually not adapted to women in architecture, meaning uh, the women were confronted in both systems with the same problems of double shift and uh, uh, missing representations and so on, um, which you can see, uh, for instance, in this uh, uh, Association of Czech Architects Founding Council from 1969, where on the uh, on the board there are actually solely men, uh, only men, and there is only single one woman in the uh, in the audiences. Um, and and actually, like for during our research on women in architecture, we actually like. Uh, discovered two emancipatory initiatives, one, one exhibition in 1947, uh, which was entitled Women in Fight, Work and Creation, and it was designed by a collective of architects, like women architects, which was quite surprising. And then, um, for instance, there was no journal, no journal dedicated to women in architecture in the um, post-war time, but there was one exhibition which we discovered, which was a great surprise that was dedicated to 27 women architects in South Moravia. So this is like uh, the, the logo type of this like women in architecture exhibition from 1985. Yeah, so that's, that's all for me. So, uh, so to, to conclude, like I was trying to draw these parallels between the two worlds uh, and, and uh, yeah, look at the master studio, bureaucratic office, collective and women's destiny in architecture. Thank you very much for the presentation and I do not dare to ask any questions or to give any comments because we are a little bit out of, of time but we can continue later in the collective discussion here. Uh, the next speaker is Vaidas Petrolis who comes from Lithuania. He's an architectural historian, senior researcher at the Institute for Architecture and Construction at Kaunas University. He is author and co-author of scientific works of monographs, books uh, on Lithuanian architecture, especially in the 20th century and on heritage conservation of 20th century um, architecture. 
and one of his books was the monograph Heritage as Conflict, so he's also a specialist in dissonant heritage and heritage conflicts. And he was the co-author of the UNESCO nomination dossier under the wonderful title Modern Kaunas, the Architecture of Optimism 1919-1939, which was successful, congratulations. So currently he is focusing on the studies of Lithuanian expatriate architects in the US and in Canada, and he will give a speech on this aspect and on architects who had the choice and, and either to be deported to Siberia or to go to the US and to Canada and there to think about the future. So it is the, the fate of or the destination of expatriates and of exiled and emigrating architects from Lithuania. And you had one and a, a half year you had now in Canada and in the US to do your researches, so we will um, get fresh information now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jörg, for kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak here. Uh, especially keeping in mind that I will not talk about modernism and I will not talk about Eastern part uh, of uh, our world. So, but nevertheless, I think that uh, uh, my presentation is in the right place uh, because when we talk about uh, curtain wall, I uh, really uh, love to hear in, in, in the first presentation of Blaje about uh, uh, reminding us about nylon work not nylon uh, uh, wall, but in my opinion, actually, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the phenomena of two worlds, uh, there is a third way, not just being on one side, on another side, but being on another side uh, with a feeling that you belong to other side. Uh, so actually, I will talk about Lithuanians uh, who left uh, uh, Lithuania after World War II, uh, but we were forced to uh, leave Lithuania. And actually, this is a picture from the journal Life uh, in 1948, uh, which uh, uh, pictures uh, uh, alone in the new world an old Lithuanian lady. And actually, uh, it's very important uh, uh, date, uh, 1948. This is uh, the time when Lithuanians uh, uh, from the German displaced people camps started to go to United States, Australia, Canada, uh, Brazil, and diff different other uh, places. And here I should remind you a little bit about the history of Lithuanian diaspora, just in a few sentences. Actually, uh, we have uh, so-called three waves of immigrants. Uh, immigrants. Uh, first wave were economic immigrants uh, from, let's say, mid 19th century. And the next wave, which I will concentrate on, is after World War II. And actually, uh, they are not immigrants. We are refugees. Uh, as uh, uh, Alphonse Aydin, as our ambassador uh, in the uh, United States, uh, once said that uh, the wave of 1944, uh, uh, which is uh, described itself as a refugees, was not homogeneous, but uh, was bound together by one characteristic. It was political. Uh, so actually, uh, this uh, political issues uh, influenced uh, uh, architecture, the specific kind of architecture uh, we were building in the United States. Uh, but from the beginning, I should uh, uh, remind that uh, Lithuanians, when they went to the United States as a refugees, actually they found quite a lot of infrastructure from previous generation, from this first uh, wave, and this is one of the churches uh, which is built in Chicago. Uh, but what they did, they actually tried to adopt uh, these existing buildings uh, to the new circumstances, and uh, when they build new infrastructure, they already thinking about uh, uh, so-called national style. And uh, I think that the most important message of my presentation is that after leaving Lithuania uh, as a refugees, uh, we tried to invent a new style 
uh, which uh, should be Lithuanian. And actually, we can go into a long debate about uh, Chinatowns, about Ukrainian village in Chicago, about Polish uh, Slovak diaspora. But I think, uh, and I've discussed with many colleagues in Chicago, uh, that actually Lithuanians had a particular interest in creating something new but Lithuanian. And again, it's a long, uh, a long uh, discussion and debate, and probably we bring this idea from interwar Lithuania, and here is a nice uh, flaw from Church of the Holy Cross in Chicago, uh, uh, this, uh, this church, but it was, uh, oh, sorry, it's, uh, uh, this church, but it was reconstructed in 1950. It's one of the earliest uh, uh, works of Lithuanian architects uh, in Chicago. Uh, but if you've been in Kaunas, uh, there is Kaunas Post Office, and in Kaunas Post Office, which was built in 1930, uh, we have a nice floor which was made uh, on example of Lithuanian textile, uh, uh, and the tiling was like ornamented, very similar in this case in the Church of the Holy Cross in Chicago. So there is a kind of relation between interwar but, uh, and uh, 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 and uh, after World War II, but uh, still the idea to have a specific national style was quite unique, I, I suppose. And uh, the reason of this idea, uh, the reason of this uh, invention was uh, two uh, important aspects, I think. The one important aspect is international community, because we were thinking about keeping Lithuania's name in a political discourse, uh, and uh, still uh, trying to convince that Lithuania exists, and please do not forget Lithuania. And as one of the architects, Edmund Sarbas Arbochowska said, a very few foreigners understand Lithuania, and therefore can't admire Lithuanian literature, but everyone will stop to admire the buildings. So the idea was to show our Lithuanian, I don't know, heritage, cultural, uh, uh, identity in form of architecture. And one of such uh, great examples was Lithuanian Cross uh, in a World Fair in 1964 in New York, especially uh, when you see the context. The context is super modern, uh, but we have the cross, which is uh, uh, specifically Lithuanian. Another interesting example is um, a competition for Lithuanian embassy in Brazil, which was never implemented, unfortunately, but still it was like a kind of a statement that we do exist. Uh, another reason, obviously, uh, and here, by the way, oh, sorry for, and here is, by the way, a really interesting quote uh, that the Hungarian professor Andrei Fazekas uh, uh, writes to the letter to Jonas Molokas, one of the architects, that I thought that Lithuanians were closely related to Slavs, but now, looking at this church, I realized that uh, they are nation of their own right. And here is the famous, uh, uh, famous church in Chicago with the towers, uh, uh, which was made uh, in the spirit of Lithuanian national architecture, and I will talk about this a little bit later. So in a way, it was a successful try. And I see this architecture as a part of a bigger movement uh, uh, to claim our independence back. And uh, you can see Lithuanians parading in the streets of Chicago, so architecture have the same uh, reason. Another important message is for Lithuanian community, because Lithuanians actually were missing Lithuania, obviously, being outside, and uh, 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 this is one of the reasons how to, how to exist, how to, why to build uh, this uh, architecture and why to invent this national style, because it becomes a strategy of preserving Lithuanian, Lithuanian culture and identity in the conditions of exile. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the idea and uh, the motivation was quite clear. Uh, the question how to do this is, was not so easy. And actually, we had a big debate, is it possible at all to have such a phenomenon as Lithuanian architecture. Uh, and it was a debate uh, inside of Lithuanian diaspora. Uh, uh, now probably it's not the time to go deeper, but uh, the, if to make a summary, uh, if we do, I don't know, have the possibilities of the 21st century, of the 20th century, and if we do construct uh, uh, buildings in a really like modern way, like it was done in, even uh, in interwar, but uh, 
uh, well, Miss van der Rohe was building his famous buildings uh, at a similar time. Uh, why do we have to fill uh, these uh, structures, with steel structures, with traditional, uh, traditional uh, way? But, uh, and it was like a big tension between two uh, sides. One side, this is a nice uh, church uh, uh, in, uh, in Mississauga, near Toronto, in Chicago, which uh, resembles uh, one of the Lithuanian uh, Gothic church in the Pishkis. Uh, you can see with facades, uh, so one is to create something in Lithuania. Another uh, uh, tendency was uh, to make international architecture, and uh, both ways were uh, competing each other. And actually, if you want to do something Lithuanian, first what it comes into your mind is use visual uh, signs, visual signals. And uh, if you travel across the United States, and we did with Wilte, uh, uh, quite a lot. You will find a lot of Lithuanian names, Lithuanian symbols. I will not go deeper into this, but probably one of the uh, good examples is Lithuanian room in Detroit, where you can find uh, uh, obviously some uh, Lithuanian uh, famous buildings, famous signs, and etc. etc. Uh, but probably, it's, uh, and this is um, again Vitis uh, Lithuanian uh, symbol in Chicago, but probably this is, uh, I would say, quite simple way of doing this and maybe less interesting. Another way was uh, using neo-baroque as Lithuanian inspired and obviously Vilnius inspired style. And uh, again, uh, this is the sketch for, uh, for the church in, uh, in um, Chicago and uh, obviously the authors themselves uh, claims that, well, we do interpret baroque. Uh, but at the same period, uh, some Lithuanian architects, uh, historians, they actually uh, criticize this approach by, by saying that repetition of historical styles such as Gothic or Baroque in a new epoch lacks the authenticity of original and the grace to the level of the copy. And this is another neo-Baroque example in Chicago by Jonas Kowalski Skola. And the last uh, option was interpreting folk art. And actually, this is, uh, uh, you can see the pictures um, on the right side uh, of some Lithuanian wooden architecture, obviously in Lithuania, and we tried this to install into a new context. And here is uh, an example of uh, competition for the Lithuanian Youth Center, and you can notice that inside of a modern building, we do use uh, some wooden structures. Uh, but the most important uh, way of doing this was to use a uh, symbol of the cross or even wayside chapel, uh, which was really interesting in Lithuanian phenomena. I, and by the way, this is UNESCO immaterial uh, heritage uh, uh, with the tradition of wood carving. And here, very interesting example uh, by Jonas Molokas. He suggested uh, to make an altar, but this is, just, this is a sketch, but still it was uh, 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 the cross was important, and probably it comes to the hill of crosses near the Cholet in Lithuania. And this is original um, wooden wayside shrines, which were transferred uh, uh, into the Chicago context, uh, for example, as, uh, as like traditional uh, wooden structures, but also as a, uh, a part of professional, or I say like monumental architecture. And the first example was uh, uh, in Kennebunport. Uh, you can see on the top, uh, which was made from concrete, but already uh, you can recognize this uh, interpretation of the wayside uh, shrine. And uh, obviously the most important and the most interesting example of this um, uh, phenomena is in Chicago. And these uh, towers actually they are made uh, obviously from concrete and they are quite awkward and strange, I would say. Uh, but uh, obviously uh, you will recognize immediately that this is Lithuanian. And uh, uh, if you go across the United States, you will find quite a lot of uh, uh, interpretations in the Spain spirit. Uh, for example, Stachis Kudokas, again in Chicago, or Jonas Kowalski Skova or uh, the Molokas, Jonas Molokas, who made um, uh, the Transfiguration Church in New York. And by the way, uh, this is the symbol, uh, it was uh, recognized by the New York Times, one of the best buildings in 1962, and uh, uh, it was on the front uh, 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 page, uh, together with, uh, you can recognize Eros Arnon and his famous uh, um, 
uh, airport, uh, Terminal 5 in New York. And uh, actually, what is really interesting, what Lithuanians nevertheless, they used, and different architects used uh, uh, this approach, actually, uh, it was a lot of criticism on this uh, uh, idea, and uh, as Kazimir Zoromsky says, using elements of wood carving has nothing to do with authentic art, neither the national style. So this is uh, the last slide. To conclude, actually, I think it's really unique and interesting phenomena, uh, which is not about, uh, I don't know, think like masters of modern movement, not about modern movement itself, but about the conditions of the 20th century and the second half of the 20th century. And I would say that these uh, buildings, they are like perfect monuments to the Cold War. Uh, because, as uh, Elizabeth Mock says, that democracy needs monuments, even though its requirements are not uh, those of dictatorship. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation. And only one question directly. The, the client who commissioned these buildings is this. Th there were a lot of churches, of uh, cemeteries, uh, of Lithuanian youth centers and so on of the Lithuanian community. Is this the client or so it is only a segment of the whole work of the whole offer of these architects? Uh, actually, I think it's one of the most important aspects of this phenomenon uh, because I would say that uh, the client who was Lithuanian community was even more important than architects because it was the intention, uh, the like intentional wish to do something. So the client, obviously, Lithuanian community, we asked architects as the professionals to do something. And obviously, it was a both way discussion. And if we uh, talk about famous uh, Lithuanian buildings in the United States, so uh, in the period from 50, 1950 to 65, I think this uh, uh, search for national style was dominant. After 65, probably uh, the situation is already changing. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, insight, not only beyond the Iron Curtain, but beyond the Atlantic and the ocean to Canada and uh, the US. The next speaker, they come from uh, from Tirana, so they represent Albania. This is Denada Weissatz and uh, Girgi Islami. Um, may I invite you and um, uh, introduce you? Uh, Denada uh, Weissatz graduated in architecture at the Polytechnic University in Tirana in 2007. Uh, in 2015, she earned her PhD specializing in mathematical tools and advanced analytical methods for studying urban structures. Her research centers on the belief that sophisticated geometric systems enhance our ability to interpret and uh, analyze urban patterns across tangible and intangible dimensions. Uh, between 2013 and 16, she did a postgraduate and postdoctoral uh, studies uh, in Rotterdam focusing on advanced urbanism theories, urban dynamics and governance, and she had some publications documenting Albania's communist era architecture. She is also active at the Polytechnic University in Tirana, and now she serves as an associate professor and director of the Department of Architecture. And as I learned, her dedication is also the Albanian Architects Association, where she was general secretary and member of the, um, of the presidency. And Kirgi Islami is also an Albanian architect and educator. He studied architecture at the Eastern Mediterranean University in Cyprus. And then he studied Conservation Cultural Authority in Urbino, in Italy. And then uh, he completed his PhD at the Polytechnic University in Tirana. So three studies as far as I saw. And see, since 2004, he has been a lecturer and researcher in the Department of Architecture in Tirana. And starting from 2022, he holds the position of an associate professor at the Tirana University. His work covers architectural design, environmental science, and cultural heritage conservation as well. And he is author and co-author of 
books and cu curator and co uh, curator of exhibitions on socialist architecture in Albania. He works as an architect and planning consultant and won several prizes. I learned. It's up to you. you are, the floor is, is yours you. or, or, or for one of you at least. Presentation, I have a very small intervention and then will take the floor, but yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's the first time for us to be here at the Bilecki Institute and uh, to be part of uh, Exercise in moderni Modernity as a program. Thank you very much. We had the opportunity to listen to very interesting um, narratives and uh, contextual stories. Um, actually, I would like to start with very a few words about uh, our involvement in such project. As you might have heard from our biographies, we are not historians of architecture. But uh, uh, personally, I am an architect, uh, educated and uh, operating in a post-communist societies, society. So uh, during my experience as an architect, both of us have been facing challenges um, that uh, we think that generate from uh, our uh, communist past. Uh, given the, uh, the fact that uh, in Albania today, uh, nobody wants to talk that much about uh, the communist past, uh, we thought that would be an interesting, uh, um, let's say, idea to, to enter into such project and to get into touch with uh, all the uh, heritage that uh, is being uh, silent, silent until now related to the communist past. Uh, more specifically, I had an interest uh, in the into the creative processes and into the relationships established between ideology and uh, propaganda with creative processes. Uh, we have been trying to answer questions such as, um, sorry, I might need uh, the presentation. Thank you. So we have been trying to answer questions such as what was the role of the architect during the communist period and uh, what was the choreography, if we might say so, of a uh, uh, design process during the communist period. So uh, these uh, ideas and these questions led us to uh, this research project, a collaboration between uh, uh, the Department of Architecture and the National Construction uh, Archives. So for more than five years, we, uh, we have had access to an immense quantity of design projects crafted during the communist period. And uh, we have been able to identify uh, very uh, interesting uh, topics and questions that have been silent, uh, silent for more than five decades. Uh, we have choose to start this presentation uh, with this first slide uh, showing the image of the dictator of Albania, Enver Hoxha, in 74. Uh, being present during uh, discussions and debate about uh, the center of Tirana, the capital of Albania. And uh, on the other uh, side of the slide, there is uh, the title of a documentary screened in the national uh, television of Albania, depicting uh, the dictator as uh, the main architect of Albania. As, uh, and as you will see during the presentation, uh, it was not metaphorical, metaphorical at all. The main contribution of this project that uh, has been going for more than uh, five, uh, uh, five years now is, this, uh, uh, is a collection of uh, exhibitions and uh, catalogues and publications related to the main findings of this, uh, of this uh, 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 five decades of communist uh, uh, regime in Albania. I'm going to make a very panoramic descriptions, uh, description of all the main um, phases, and then Jerzy will uh, uh, follow with a more accurate rendition of uh, the political facts and uh, uh, how these facts have been translated into architecture and urban development. The first phase uh, belonged to the post-war condition, 44-48, uh, to be followed by uh, the Stalin-era architecture, 48-58, um, and then to be followed uh, by another type of developments during 58 and 75. Uh, Jerzy will uh, describe a little bit more the similarities uh, between Albania and the Eastern Bloc. And then uh, 75 and 91, uh, that will be, let's say, the key topic of this presentation because uh, we think that somehow it resonates uh, 
a lot with the idea of the curtain uh, wall because of the full isolation of Albania and because of a very specific uh, architectural product that was developed during this uh, period. Jerzy? Thank you. <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, then I explained a little bit about uh, these phases of uh, uh, evolution of architecture in Albania uh, uh, in four different periods in which we are uh, interested more about the last one, but uh, for having a, a full apprehension of that, okay, we have to, to go through some facts. So, uh, as you see, I, I made a timeline uh, divided in three uh, periods, starting from 1948, because from 44 to 48, probably uh, there is uh, nothing that happens, so there is a reconstruction process after the war. And uh, uh, starting with our uh, breakup with Yugoslavia, which was our uh, patronate in uh, uh, Albania was the patronate of Yugoslavia during the first years after war. Uh, they break up with Soviet Union, and uh, we do the same, and uh, we become okay, a satellite country of, of the Soviet Union. Then we go into the Stalinist architecture, because I mean, we were following uh, uh, blindly the, uh, what is happening in the, in the leader of the Eastern Bloc. And we start with this neoclassical uh, uh, architecture that uh, uh, was being cultivated in that period. Uh, with the death of Stalin, then, OK, we go to Khrushchev. Khrushchev uh, makes this uh, uh, industrialization, destalinization, firstly, of the country, and then uh, starts the, uh, pushing towards industrialization and uh, a simplification of architecture, which we find very comfortable because it means uh, uh, constructing cheaper and faster, and uh, uh, of course, uh, we obey still to the Soviet Union. But in 1961, we break up with the Soviets because we think, okay, they're going the wrong way. Uh, so we remain till the end the only uh, Stalinist country in Europe. So that's why we have a different path. We break with the Soviets, and starting from 1961, then we have this uh, uh, affiliation with China. So breaking with the Soviets means we get isolated from the rest of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, we were already isolated from uh, uh, the rest of Western uh, uh, countries, so we have just one single ally that is leading our uh, development. Uh, they start the Chinese Cultural Revolution. We follow the Chinese Cultural Revolution, uh, which is uh, it's building a set of preconditions for uh, applying then differences to architecture. So first of all, uh, we have uh, the removal of military grades in the army. Then we have uh, the war against bureaucracy. So it means uh, uh, putting people, uh, uh, office people, into production and making them uh, more. Uh, more effective, and then we have the war against religion. Uh, Albania uh, closes all churches and mosques uh, uh, in, in the country and becomes, by constitution, later the only atheist country, uh, country in the world. There is no other one. And uh, yeah, uh, starting from 1972, there is a campaign still in the uh, uh, atmosphere of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a uh, campaign against art, music, literature, and then at the end, architecture, for uh, applying wrongly the principles of socialism. So what it means, it means that uh, uh, people were not understanding well the way they should go, and they were criticized for having foreign expressions in their way of doing art or architecture. and. From that point starts the different path we have with Eastern Europe. So till there, we somehow go parallel, more isolated, bar, but we, uh, we cultivate uh, this rational architecture. I, I don't want to call it modern because, in my opinion, it's uh, not, and I'll give you the arguments later. But uh, uh, from 1975, we start to get divided. Then we see. So what we cultivated from uh, the end of 50s till 1975. Uh, at the top, there is the Palace of Culture. The first stone of that was uh, put by Nikita Khrushchev in 1959 in his visit in Tirana, uh, uh, which showed the direction the architecture uh, should, uh, should take. So this uh, uh, clean style from ornamentation, okay, overpassing the 
uh, uh, the Stalinist architecture was the first monument to show that we have to change architecture. Then we started with prefabrication, then we went uh, uh, somehow deeper with this uh, uh, exploration of, uh, uh, let's call it a, a modernity. Uh, yeah, but we were isolated one, while we were doing that. From 1961, we broke up with the Soviets, so we continued ourselves. Uh, we like this because we had to, uh, the slogan was building cheaper, faster and better. And uh, we didn't know anything about modernism because we didn't have a school of architecture. There was no Western literature. Uh, there was very few literature from uh, the East that was coming and none of the Czech magazines referring uh, uh, what was happening in the West, as our colleague told to us. So this isolation uh, brought us to uh, somehow reinterpreting uh, the modern. Uh, then we have uh, seeing uh, the previous images that reflect somehow a modern uh, aesthetics, uh, we have this campaign against modernism in Albania. And Verhoja himself is trying to focus where? In the principles of uh, Stalinist architecture, uh, national informants, socialist in content. So he is pressing to the national identity in his text. And then we have Kuitin Buza, which is a, a painter, ex-director of the Gallery of Fine Arts uh, during socialism, that he is criticizing architects in how they are doing architecture. He's saying, okay, there is a confusion and ambiguity in understanding modernity in architecture, confusing it with modernism. So he's distinguishing clearly modernity and modernism as two separate things. And what is more nice, and I would like to read this, uh, is Alfred Ucci, an art critic, who is saying, we have faced and we will continuously uh, combat modernism, this dangerous enemy. In the battle against it, we should enter well armed with knowledge on its history, on its earliest and recent appearances, on its regressive character, and on its counter-revolutionary core, with knowledge on its philosophic and aesthetic fundamentals, in a way that any illusion about its nature fades. Only in this way it can be completely unmasked by arguments. The social source of modernism is the pre-existence of an old reaction, uh, reactionary order of the reactionary society, uh, societal forces that aim to neutralize and to demoralize the revolutionary forces by spreading anti-scientific, reactionary, philosophical and political, moral and artistic, religious and legal perspectives. The social source of modernism are the capitalist order, the reactionary bourgeois, uh, bourgeois and uh, revisionism. So this is the uh, official uh, position towards modernism in Albania. And in 1975, after the critics in art and uh, in uh, uh, music, okay, and literature, comes the uh, uh, time of the architects, where five architects get uh, sorry for this, uh, get uh, uh, punished. Uh, somebody, somebody by being transferred, somebody also by getting into prison, not only for faults in architecture, which is Socrat Mosco, Petrash Kolevica, Max Velo, Kocho Chomi, and Maurizio Bego. And uh, yeah, here it starts the period of national architecture. National architecture with the slogan national in form and socialist in content, borrowed from Stalin because we were still Stalinist, the only ones uh, in the world after 1961 uh, and then after 1978 by breaking with China. So, uh, Socrat Moscow had to write an own autocritic to escape from this uh, danger, saying that some of us architects, including me, fell under the influence of the false brilliance of advertising bourgeois revisionist architecture. So uh, he is admitting the fault and uh, telling to others that this is really dangerous. Uh, this picture is taken from uh, from the time there is a building with a, a, a writing over that that is saying the power belongs to the one who has the right to make decisions. And everybody would understand this to the people. But if we enlarge the picture, we see that over the writing, there is the name Enver, which re refers to Enver Hoja, and uh, the PPSH, P -P which is the party of labor of Albania. So the power belongs really to those who make decisions. And explaining how the project was conceived during this period, OK, we try to, to schematize this. 
in two directions. So from the government, uh, there was the control over the state university, then to architects that participated in this big institute, similar to the ones that our colleague from uh, Czech Republic explained us. And the other direction was through the League of Artists and Writers, which were communicating directly with institutes. And architects had to go through technical councils and produce projects. So uh, a vertical hierarchy in two directions controlling the ideology over architecture. And how to produce this kind of architecture? Yeah, it had to be national in form, as our uh, uh, colleague from Lithuania said, very simple put all the history on the facade. This is the National History Museum uh, of Albania. It's very clear to everybody and cannot be misinterpreted. A second case, if you see to the building, this is a palace of sports in Korcha. Uh, looks very, let's say, modern. Okay, but for escaping the risk of being targeted as modern, the architect had to make the ceiling, this is the plan of the ceiling, uh, this ceiling in here, with the uh, motifs, decorating motifs of traditional Albanian carpets, so to be safe ideologically. And he writes himself about this thing. And on the other hand, this is the most interesting one, not built, but not because they didn't like it. They, built, they didn't build this because they changed plans, uh, reinterpreting the national symbol in a plan. This is a railway station. OK. And in conclusions, okay, why are we doing this job? We're doing this job because we want to have an objective reading of, uh, of our past, first of all. Uh, there is now a tendency to romanticize uh, uh, the facts and to say that we were cultivating a modernism in which we do not believe, uh, to, to be honest. And uh, yeah, we want to provide facts to avoid theoretical misreading of the uh, uh, developments. So uh, somebody called uh, this period as uh, postmodernism, uh, somebody very important. And uh, we had uh, some debate uh, with them because we think a precondition for having postmodernism is having modernism. So uh, if you don't have that, OK, uh, probably it doesn't work. And the. Yeah, I, w I was talking about Professor uh, uh, Cohen. And uh, yeah, and uh, Socialist uh, Albania versus the Eastern Bloc. This is the uh, Palace uh, of Sport in Korcha, and this is, is the Palace of Sport in Minsk. In Minsk. Uh, probably also some plagiarism, but this is not uh, uh, the topic. Uh, there is a very similar aesthetics in what we do. But the process of producing architecture is totally different, so I think uh, uh, this is uh, 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 something to distinguish from the, from the rest. And the last slide, we think uh, we have to fill a void in what is called the Eastern Bloc history of architecture, which doesn't say a word about uh, Albania and doesn't recognize this separate path that Albania chose with its nationalist architecture in the last uh, decades of the regime. Thank you and sorry for taking some few minutes. Thank you very much for introducing Albania um, in this, this uh, circle here in the discussion and to represent it. Um, now, I, I, I would like to uh, attract the attention of the speakers to the clock in front of this uh, uh, floor here, because m many of you, you are looking at your slices and you do not appreciate that we do not have en enough time, so please. <laughs> Take, uh, be short because we have only uh, two thirds now of the whole program of this session. So I will, that is why I will not ask any questions about um, Tirana and about the situation, about the theater in Tirana, the destination of the theater, what has happened there and all these things. But I hope that we have the time to discuss it uh, in the final uh, panel session here. I would like to introduce Artur Sagula and Milos Kortinska, uh, both are from, uh, from Wuch, from uh, studied architecture and urban planning. Uh, Mr. Sagula also 
studied in Kent Institute for uh, Art Design in Canterbury and has an MA in Art and Architecture. His doctoral thesis was awarded by the Minister of Infrastructure and uh, at Krakow University and he's author of books and scientific architectures and monographs and his interest is history of architecture and urban planning and of contemporary architecture and relationship between architecture and art uh, as well. You will speak for both of you. Yes. Yes. Well, ah, okay. The professor Zagua that you've uh, introduced to the audience is absent today. He is ab absent today. Nevertheless, he, he is not today accompanied, but he is co authorized, so to say, by Milos Gortinsky, who is a, a designer, artist, and publicist at the, the design school in Wuch as well. He joined the interdisciplinary doctoral school in Wuchon University on technology in 2021, starting his academic career with examination of the authoritarian architecture features in the architecture built today in the European Union. Um, and his doctoral dissertation is on the open society according to the theory created by Karl Popper as an idea present in architecture of Poland in the years 1956 and to 2004. And it is this idea of Karl Popper of the open society, this concept which is widely known, but until now it has not been used for architectural research. And this open uh, form concept and closed form concept of Karl Popper will be brought in a relationship to uh, Hansen, who was already introduced here in this session. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Again, thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, just as I said, uh, the Professor Zagua unfortunately could not uh, attend to our meeting today because he is representing Poland uh, on Malta uh, Island, I uh, believe. Uh, the topic that we are going to, well, uh, introduce you today uh, is uh, strongly connected with the topic of the conference itself. And to be honest, uh, it started uh, from the uh, background, uh, rather uh, untypical background because uh, firstly uh, I've prepared uh, the, some kind of a dissertation, the draft of the article, and then uh, uh, it appeared to me that uh, the Pilecki Institute in Berlin uh, uh, organized the open call for this uh, exceptional and international conference. So in a way, I was uh, trying to prepare a scientific text about uh, a correlation between the open form in modernist architecture and the open society according to Karl Popper. And then uh, I've discovered this conference. So uh, it's quite significant, uh, significant the initial shape of this presentation and the topic itself. All right, so the plan of the presentation is going to include uh, three main parts, which is uh, the introduction, uh, the swift explanation of the topic and uh, the uh, the article terms uh, presented in the, this speech. Then I'm going to present you uh, two architectural examples uh, designed by the uh, core uh, historical figure presented uh, previously by Mr. Błażej uh, Czarkowski. Uh, and then uh, it will lead us to some kind of a justification. Well, as we are aware, the modernism itself and the modernism, uh, modernist architecture uh, basically um, is a perfect example. It's, it's complex, but it's a perfect example of a cultural uh, phenomenon that occurred both on the West and East. And uh, despite the fact that uh, the uh, sociological and ideological background was different, um, the results were quite similar and they contribute to, the, to our uh, not so dissonant heritage, I would say, today in a significant uh, way. Uh, when it comes to the modernism design in Poland, it was represented by people such as uh, Józef Kabankorski, who used to design our excellent modernist architecture right before the war and after the war as well, by people such as Marek Lejkam, Oskar Hansen, or uh, Bolesław Kardaszewski. And I will introduce you now to the interesting man 
who was Oskar Hansen. Oskar Hansen was born in uh, 1922 in Helsinki, and uh, he spent his youth and entire life and career in Poland. Uh, he left the Finland when he was only four years old, but this Finland was preserved in his soul in some way, and I will prove it to you by, his, uh, by the examples of his uh, material architecture actually realized, because his views were so um, outstanding and rather controversial, sometimes radical, uh, only a small number of his designs uh, faced the uh, realization uh, in the nearest future. And what is important uh, is that he uh, gained the education during the World War II, uh, when he was in Vilanus, I believe. He firstly graduated from the painting uh, faculty in 1942, and right after war he continued, uh, continued his studies uh, on a sculpture faculty uh, from the 1945 and eventually graduated in 1915. Then he left to France where he was uh, acquainted with people such as Le Corbusier, with whom he was very hostile. Uh, he also uh, started his career with uh, people such as Pierre Generet and was highly inspired with uh, works uh, of Picasso and Picasso himself. What is really important is uh, that Oskar Hansen uh, designed his uh, most uh, recognizable works with his uh, wife Zofia. But uh, we are going to talk mainly about him because he was also a member of a Team 10 and uh, and also uh, the Siam uh, at all. So uh, he was uh, quite literally standing with one foot on the west and the second foot on the east. He was a socialist by belief, but he never joined the Socialist Party in Poland. And so he represented modernist architecture, but his views were hostile towards the entire Athenian charter. Uh, he believed that uh, the cult material culture, including architecture of his age, of our age, is dominated by the closed form. He, the belief in open and closed form uh, expressed by Oskar Hansen was nothing new, to be honest. He, he just um, enriched the uh, beliefs made by uh, Eric Fromm uh, and uh, applied it uh, on the arts, uh, architecture, and design, uh, mainly on the architecture, because his belief was that through good architecture design, one can uh, attempt to formulate a new kind of democratical society. And that's exactly true. He, that's, he, uh, that formulates his entire uh, architectural struggle. Uh, what's more, the open form, by his definition, was the form in which the piece of art, architecture, or design does not um, treat the audience uh, in some kind of uh, autocratical way. Uh, instead, it allows uh, the spectator to define the meaning of a piece. Uh, so it absolutely changes the weight of the weight of a topic. <coughs> okay, there we go. Vitalje. Oh yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to the open form itself, uh, Oskar Hansen believed that uh, centralized architecture represents the closed form. So his uh, struggle was surrounded uh, around the open form, which was supposed to be decentralized in order to preserve some kind of uh, democratical taste in architecture itself. Uh, and uh, many of you, majority of you, are uh, familiar to the Karl Raimund Popper, uh, who was an uh, extraordinary Austrian uh, philosopher. Firstly, he used to be uh, the Marxist, and then uh, he was uh, known for uh, his uh, brilliant uh, uh, critique of the Marxist philosophy, uh, in which he expressed his uh, concerns about the open society. Open society understood as a society that uh, doesn't, that uh, expresses natural strife uh, for uh, some kind of a social uh, progress, but progress not in a revolutionary way nor in a conservative way. He believed that uh, the true democratic society that uh, is mature enough to change its uh, uh, leaders and cultural uh, content without spilling blood. 
And he, he believed that uh, the key to attain such society is uh, in uh, modifying the tradition. And my question was, is there any common ground between open form and open society? And the short answer to that question is yes and no. And the architecture is a good spectrum to actually notice that, because uh, Oskar Hansen, in some way, uh, had uh, held a similar uh, goal as uh, Karl Raimund Popper did. Uh, I was curious, and uh, I even asked the Polish journalist, uh, Philip Springer, who was specialized in the topic of Zofia and Oskar Hansen and their designs, uh, if Hansen, being uh, almost a foreigner and member of the Team 10, uh, did he know English uh, language? Uh, because the, the uh, first e Polish issue of the book uh, made by Karl Raimund Popper, Open Society and Its Enemies, uh, Marx Helgel, was published in 1987. And it, I discovered that uh, the answer is negative. Uh, Oskar Hansen spoke uh, Finnish, Polish, French, but not English. That's the uh, core uh, reason why he didn't stay in London despite the fact he had a chance. Uh, when it comes to his uh, realizations and his uh, attempt to materialize open form in uh, Polish uh, modernist architecture, he, uh, just as I said, uh, managed to realize only a few of his projects with his uh, wife, Zofia. And uh, f first, uh, the most recognizable and uh, probably the most uh, significant uh, design he ever made was uh, uh, modernist uh, estate in Lublin, which was, by the way, I suppose it doesn't work, which was uh, the mortalization of his most uh, controversial uh, belief, which was the concept of continual linear uh, city uh, system. Uh, just as Blasek Tcharkovsky introduced you to this idea, uh, he believed that uh, the nature itself and in its shape uh, suggests the uh, preferable shape of the architecture and uh, human space. Uh, well, he managed to create a, uh, a state in Lublin in which he partially realized some of his radical beliefs. And also, what is really uh, interesting, uh, he had uh, very democratical approach towards uh, his design because uh, what, uh, with what he started his work, he started with survey of a people for whom he designed the estate and housing. And uh, the survey was about uh, asking a question such as what is the family model, what is the profession, and so and so on. And in that way, uh, it defined the way, thank you very much, the architecture was designed. Unfortunately, the socialist reality was such that uh, the living space he designed with his wife uh, at the end uh, fell into uh, hands of completely different people because uh, people used to cheat and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, when it comes to the architecture, he was trying to uh, leave the space for uh, individualization of the architecture, which was at the end the catastrophe, not so visible in Lublin as it was uh, visible in Warsaw. I will uh, show you in the next example. In uh, the, this slide show, you can see uh, the continuous linear system materialized in the form of uh, long block houses and reached with some kind of uh, short uh, point uh, block houses dominating the sky. Uh, even though uh, the living estate had no real dominant uh, character characteristic to the closed form uh, and the in our, uh, entire estate uh, was designed in such a way to protect uh, the inhabitants uh, from uh, the streets like uh, medieval castle walls. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see the space filled with uh, trade pavilions, which is uh, probably the most uh, recognizable part of this uh, estate. And today, uh, more or less on the center, you can see the church, uh, which doesn't even go with this place. Uh, Oskar Hansen uh, was uh, atheist, but he expressed some kind of a uh, uh, spiritual way of designing modernism because, for example, the ground gathered from beneath the ground to prepare the ground for uh, building blocks uh, was actually um, actually remains on the estate forming some kind of uh, artificial 
uh, mountains. Uh, it uh, really helped to preserve uh, wilderness and the natural uh, outcome of the entire uh, space. What you can see is that every uh, balcony on the uh, long blockhouse uh, bears the uh, features of the individual space. Uh, however, the, the state uh, suffered uh, from typical uh, problems of every uh, modernist uh, city space, such as oversimplification, which uh, was tr uh, troublesome for people who actually were supposed to live there. So uh, people such as Stanislav Kukurika uh, organized uh, artists to decorate uh, such blockhouses and uh, such plain spaces with uh, decorations made of uh, industrial junk. Uh, when it comes to the open form, it actually was expressed also in concrete playgrounds, which uh, were used uh, on uh, 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 estates uh, such as uh, the one in Lublin. But uh, the problem is that many elements, uh, despite the fact that this uh, architecture can be easily recognized as purely moderni uh, modernist, uh, the open form was so radical that it uh, even uh, opened the way with no return uh, for this architect because uh, some elements uh, he designed uh, were, had no other function than only spiritual or uh, aesthetical one. It's important to remember that uh, he was rather artist and uh, despite the fact he was uh, hostile towards uh, Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier who was responsible for the idea of a machine to living, the Oscar Hansen was responsible for designing an art to living. And so, so he even described his blockhouses and some kind, as some kind of a sculpture. And it exactly can be spotted in Warsaw, when his second and probably the most uh, um, negative, impactful uh, piece of architecture was designed, uh, namely Grochowski Abutment, uh, which was, uh, in short way, described a gallery building uh, characteristic uh, to some uh, some places in Europe, but definitely not Warsaw. Uh, the building itself was problematic uh, because uh, despite the fact it was very open to its uh, users, it also opened uh, the ways for uh, immoral ways, uh, for immoral uh, figures such as burglars and thieves, because a uh, building that had multiple uh, staircases was a perfect example of architecture that can be robbed with no consequences and with no risk of robber being caught. And when it comes to the space that he designed for the people, it can be easily recognized that people actually built metal crates and bars to protect their windows because it was absolutely typical for people to lose everything in spite of a single day because the architecture Oscar and Zofia Hansen designed was by definition troublesome and the open form could be an interesting form of belief that the final result was far from uh, acquiring open society. Uh, in fact, it was the opposite. Uh, what we can also spot is that uh, the abutment, the uh, complexes uh, they designed, uh, were in fact the megastructure. So they were striving far away from uh, open form itself. Uh, it's rather interesting that the train uh, pavilions are the most democratic uh, spaces they've ever designed. Uh, ah, yes. But uh, instead, uh, despite the fact that Oscar uh, made some uh, significant uh, statements, uh, such as that we've got some kind of a problem with storing history and memory, uh, the architecture he built and the design uh, had difficulties to actually obtain the needs of the people for whom he designed, because he had a quite artistic uh, core belief behind this architecture. Uh, when it comes to the spaces he designed, uh, he believed that uh, the centralized space uh, should uh, encourage people to use it, uh, but uh, as long as you visit Warsaw and the uh, Grochowski abutment, you will discover that every door uh, 
expect from you initial way, uh, individual way of thinking and entering, which is obviously troublesome. Uh, well, I failed to be as swift as frank as possible, so thank you for your attention. I am looking forward for discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for technical problems. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for the presentation and also for this um, inspiring uh, connection between Hansen um, and Karl Popper and also the examples of the children playgrounds, which were very convincing, I think. Um, now comes uh, the last speaker, the speaker's woman, it is Anna Ivanovska Deskova uh, from Skopje. She will represent Skopje and she is accompanied by uh, Jovan Ivanovsky and there is a co-author whose name is Vladimir Deskov. So it's the three of you, you are the, the team which will present it now. Uh, Anna Ivanovska is an architect, architectural historian and researcher. She is associate professor at the Faculty of Architecture uh, in Skopje at the university, and she teaches courses in history of architecture and of protection of cultural heritage. Her main research interest is the architecture of the 20th century in the city of Skopje, and especially the post-earthquake reconstruction process since the 60s. In a team together with Vladimir uh, Deskov and Jovan Jovanovsky, she has already been involved in numerous research projects and publications and exhibitions and had promoted the legacy of the modern movement in Skopje in the last years. She has been member of the curatorial advisory board for the exhibition taught a concrete Utopia Architecture in Yugoslavia, 1948 to 1998, which was held in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She will give us an, an, uh, a first introduction in the situation of Skopje as, as it was after the earthquake in 1963 and the whole process of reconstruction, which was uh, supported and which was uh, uh, and endorsed by, by many experts from all over the world, and it became a very a symbol of international cooperation and of solidarity in the 80s and uh, in the 70s, and more than 80s countries were involved in this re, uh, recovery and rebuilding uh, process. So it is very interesting, and it is creating a new distinctive architectural identity uh, and the trauma of the natural disaster became a trigger for transformation and for modernization in the city, not only from an urban or from an architectural point of view, but also from a social and cultural point of view. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Thanks to the uh, organizers of the conference for the invitation to be here and to speak about Skopje. Skopje is a city of a multi-layered history, but today I will focus on one specific uh, segment of its history, is the process of post-earthquake reconstruction of Skopje. Uh, in 1963, on 26th of July, Skopje suffered an earthquake of catastrophic proportions, uh, which demolished nearly 70 to 80 percent of the total built fund of Skopje. Either demolished louder, okay. Uh, it either demolished or uh, damaged beyond repair 70 to 80 percent of the total built fund of the Skopje, uh, leaving the city, the city literally reduced to rubble. Uh, when speaking about Skopje's history, we divide the history to before and after the earthquake. At the time, Skopje was capital of Socialist Republic of Macedonia. It was the southernmost republic from the Yugoslav Federation, and it was third in size city after Belgrade and Zagreb. Uh, the news about the earthquake spread immediately within the Federation, but also outside the border of Yugoslavia, and uh, were published on many covers and many magazines. These are photos taken by American journalist Sam Notzola, who was in Skopje at the moment by chance. So he took some photos and they uh, went to Life magazine and other magazines as well, reporting about the disaster that happened to the city. The following day, 
federal delegation led by the President Tito came to Skopje. Uh, it was um, a visit that was supposed to, they, they, they were supposed to see for themselves the extent of the disaster, but also to, it was a gesture of, of sympathy that should bring back the hope and the optimism within the city. Uh, it was at this moment that the President gave uh, one famous speech, and this is one quote that, that is often cited, that uh, Skopje suffered an unprecedented catastrophe, but Skopje will be rebuilt again with the help of the entire community. It will become a symbol of brotherhood and unity. Brotherhood and unity was a very famous narrative within the Federation of Yugoslavia, both of Yugoslav and the world solidarity. It was a very strong promise given even before the Federation, even less the, the international community can sp could speak about uh, this issue. Uh, just to give a certain context, uh, the earthquake happened in the beginning of the 60s, and um, 60s were a turbulent decade in many, many ways. On the one hand, we have this large, um, how to say, advancement in uh, science, in technology. Uh, on the other hand, we have struggles for better human rights and betterment of the humanity in general. But also, it was a decade when the world was, as we saw, um, deeply divided. The world was uh, polarized to Eastern and Western bloc. And, um, it was on the brink of another war at the beginning of the 60s. So this was um, the context in which this uh, reconstruction process happened. And we believe that uh, the scope of the process, the complexity, uh, could, um, couldn't have happened without the position of the Yugoslavia at the moment at the global scene. So um, the, the, reconstruct, the reconstruction process uh, happened much because of the position of Yugoslavia and its leader, the President Tito, on the global political scene. Um, Yugoslavia was a socialist country that for decades um, tried to be equally distant or equally close to both blocs, playing with the East and the West respectively, uh, and uh, also a country that uh, since the mid-50s, since the Bruni Declaration in 1956, uh, and especially the, later the uh, first non-aligned conference in Belgrade in uh, 1961 actually paved the third path uh, within the divided world. Uh, it was the path of, of the non-aligned movement. So uh, this prominent position of Yugoslavia at the time uh, facilitated actually the reconstruction process of, of Skopje. Uh, Immediately after fir first few hours after the, the earthquake, um, help started to arrive from everywhere, uh, and it lasted in a duration of over a decade. More than 80, 80 countries worldwide uh, helped Skopje in, in various ways. Uh, the character of the assistance was different, and it was uh, much according to the current needs of the city. First, it was the most uh, necessary supplies, like medicine, food, shelters, and so on. And later on, uh, the character of help started to change, and construction material arrived, uh, as well as prefabricated structures. And uh, in the first year and a half, 18 new residential settlements were built on the outskirts of Skopje with approximately of uh, 14,000 new houses, uh, more than 10% of which were given as direct donations from different countries of the world. Um, apart from uh, the vast material and financial help to, that was coming to Skopje for a decade, uh, it was very important that many experts arrived in Skopje in different phases of the planning process and later in the process of the reconstruction. So um, the whole pro process was led by the United Nations. It was under the auspices of the United Nations. And um, many uh, international experts contributed in all the phases from the basic surveys, the analytics, process, then the planning process, and then the, the in implementation. One of the main characters being Ernest Weisman. He was Croatian architect and pre-war Siam member who at the moment was working in the United Nations. And um, here you can see an extensive publication, a book, uh, that speaks about the, the process incomplete. And it's interesting that uh, I think that these two quotes actually show very well uh, both the scope and the ambition of not only of the local government or the federal government, but the ambition of the international community regarding Skopje. 
Uh, I will go through both of them. Great natural disasters always evoke immediate humanitarian response that transcends national prejudices and the barriers of ideology. But the world's reaction to Skopje's earthquake had gone far beyond first aid and sympathetic gestures. It was as though a frustrated urge to cooperate had found in Skopje an unex uh, unexceptionable outlet. And the second one, uh, which speaks about the ambition of the United Nations and the people involved in the process, the world now expects that the new Skopje will become a model city, built not for the present but for the future. Any less eloquent result of the work by the, uh, done by the leadership of the United Nations will tell that a great opportunity has been wasted. For the, for the world's sake, Skopje has to be not just a city to live in, but also a monument to the hope in a better world. Um, as I said, many experts were involved in the process. Probably the two most prominent international experts involved in the preparation of the master plan were here Adolf Ciborowski, the Polish architect and planner, one of the planners uh, of the post-war reconstruction of Warsaw, and also Konstantinos Doxiadis, the Greek architect and planner, who was father, founder of um, the science of acoustics. Uh, the plan was further developed uh, locally within the Institute of Town Planning uh, and architecture in Skopje. Uh, what's further interesting is that the plan intentionally left blank the city center. It was a territory of two by two kilometers, which was uh, later subject to another international process, which was once again um, realized, uh, it was uh, organized by the United Nations and the Yugoslav Association of Architects. It was the competition for the city center. Um, eight teams were invited to, to do the competition. Four were Yugoslav teams for, from the major cities in Yugoslavia, and four were international. This is uh, the winning proposal of uh, Kenzo Tange and his team, namely Kenzo Tange and his team won the majority of the prize, which was divided between uh, Kenzo Tange, the Japanese proposal, and the Croatian proposal of Miščević and Wenzler. Um, this is Kenzo Tange with, uh, in front of one of the uh, models of Skopje. And uh, for the great loss of Skopje, uh, Tange envisioned two large symbolical structures. Uh, this one, the city gate, which was supposed to embrace the early 20th century uh, center of Skopje, and the city gate, which was a symbolical entrance, a large transportation hub, uh, and uh, entrance into the, the new city of Skopje. These large megastructures uh, should, with their size, should, um, how to say, um, struggle with the loss that the, the, the city has suffered with the earthquake, similar with uh, like the previous project of Tange for, for Hiroshima. Um, it is interesting that this international character of the reconstruction on the urban level also replicated on the level of architectural uh, production. And um, most of the, the uh, speakers today spoke about the same period, but in a various ways. Um, 60s and 70s were time when uh, different um, parallel architectural currents were present. It was a time of pluralism in architecture. So we see Jap Japanese metabolism, we see brutalism, we see du Dutch structuralism, and so on. And each of these uh, currents uh, came to Skopje in different way. They were adopted, they were adjusted, and a very specific um, extraordinary late uh, modern architectural collection was established in Skopje. I will just show a few buildings very quickly. Uh, some of the buildings were done by uh, low, um, foreign offices, such was the transportation center. It was the single building that was further developed by Kenzo Tange and his team in Japan. Uh, then we have uh, Yuri Konstantinovsky, a Macedonian architect who got his master degree at Yale in the time when Paul Rudolph led the School of Architecture, so he brought his influence from the States. Then we have uh, Zhivko Popovsky with the uh, City Trade Center uh, who worked with Vandenbroek and Bakema in Rotterdam, so other influences were brought to Skopje as well. Uh, some buildings were given as direct gift, uh, di direct donations, such was the um, Alfred Roth's elementary school, Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. 
or the design for the Museum of Contemporary Art after a large competition held in Warsaw. Oskar Hansen was one of the architects who were part of this competition, but the winning uh, proposal was by a group of architects called Tigers and many more others which came from uh, uh, different places in Yugoslavia or uh, local Macedonian architects who created, as I said, this very unique uh, collection of late modern architecture in Skopje, uh, which shows uh, these various influences that were coming from everywhere. Um, so at the end, I will just say that for Skopje, obviously, uh, this process was very important. It uh, rebuilt the city. It by far uh, um, improved the quality of life in housing, but also in all other uh, fields of architecture. And uh, I will just say that the narrative of solidarity and cooperation is still alive, faint though, but still alive. And one of the institutions that uh, nurtured this narrative of solidarity is exactly the Museum of Contemporary Art, which is one of the symbols of solidarity for Skopje, both the building, but as well as the story how the collection started. And um, I will show just a few slides uh, which show the recent cooperation. They, they build upon the historical uh, connections to, to build new connections for the future. This was one large um, exhibition held in Krakow in the Cultural Center in 2019 called Skopje City Architecture and Art of Solidarity. They brought back uh, the Polish donations back to Poland to, to exhibit them there. Uh, and um, a current exhibition that takes place in Kunsthal in Vienna. Uh, no feeling is final, the Skopje Solidarity Collection, uh, which is still going on. And one our recent project presented in the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, because this year we comm commemorate 60 years from the earthquake. It's the future as a project Doxiades in Skopje. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now may I invite all the speakers to come to this panel, final panel round here. <clears throat> I think you, are, you have also a microphone or two microphones you have to uh, change if, if necessary. I, I only wanted to, to ask in, it, in advance because I did not ask it uh, after the presentation of, uh, of Tirana and uh, of Skopje is how is, is the result of this? There is a Museum of World Architecture in Skopje, for example. There is a Tirana example of modernity without modernism. It's very special. Is the result of these achievements, is that appreciated by the local uh, communities by the politician? Is there an understanding of this uh, contribution and of this uh, enormous achievement which was done there? Maybe you can start. Thank you. Well, uh, as I said, Skopje went through different phases of its history. Uh, after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, uh, the context for the modernist architecture became quite uh, troublesome and, and turbulent. And um, at certain phases, we, uh, the different governments tried to stay distant from the uh, history of the social, socialist period. Uh, and um, but recently we can witness a raising level of appreciation of this heritage from the modern past. It was not like this until 10 to 15 years ago, but now, um, which, which is very important between among the uh, students of architecture, young architects, there is a bigger and bigger appreciation of the architecture of this period. Uh, the institutions are still lagging in protection. Uh, the buildings are just at the initial process of listing, but we hope that this uh, this will improve in, in the near future. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And uh, one question, what, what I have learned and what we discussed this morning is the question, how can the public opinion be reshaped or newly shaped to understand the recent uh, heritage of the last, let's say, 50 years, which are politically 
um, incorrect um, uh, today and how to deal with this. And one important aspect was, I think it was mentioned by Christoph Rauhut, that the, the view from outside, from abroad to a country back, and the transportation and the communication of this view is very important to reshape the interior side and evaluation and uh, uh, the character, how it is received by the public. And so my question is, I saw this fantastic um, exhibition from Skopje, which seems to be, a, could also be a wandering exhibition, which could be shown everywhere. And then the resonance can be, uh, be uh, beamed back, so to say, to Skopje. Do you work in this sphere, or is it only Skopjean, uh, Skopje uh, publicity which is talking about it? Well, we've been researching Skopje and its architecture for more than 15 years, and we were working a lot with the archival material because the archives were also collapsing and were struggling. And we, we have done numerous exhibitions, more than 20 to these days, uh, most of them in Skopje, but we also exhibited in Vienna, in Athens, and we were part of the curatorial advisory board for the MoMA exhibition. And as you said, uh, appreciation from abroad is very important because uh, people, in a way, need to be convinced. Someone else has to say that this is worth keeping in order to make them believe, because um, at the time when we started, uh, even architects were not quite sure whether it is worth heritage and what is worth and what's not worth. And once we started to, we, we always wanted to uh, present publicly our uh, researches. It's not only a paper, it's not only a book, it always has to be exhibition as well. And uh, we also uh, started producing architectural models in large scale, 1 to 50. So we have now a collection of over 100 buildings built in mainly 3D printed or done in MDF. And uh, we, it turned out that it's a nice tool to educate people because once they see it, the building in smaller scale, they can feel the sculpturality, they can feel the arch architectural qualities. And since this building are, most of them are in um, our decade in a not, not very nice uh, state at the moment. Uh, they have these old layers of different phases of replastering and adding commercials and everything. So this clean shape of the building helped them to appreciate the architecture more. Thank you very much. I have only noticed now uh, one uh, statement later, but I, I would like to continue uh, with, uh, with Tirana and how is the situation Yeah, yeah I have there. a question about Tirana, uh, if I may. Maybe maybe we go around this uh, okay. to, to answer my question, and then you can uh, add uh, the next question. Thank you. Yes, to following uh, uh, the question. Yeah, unfortunately in Tirana we have this very non, let's say, good situation uh, in terms of uh, uh, heritage protection, and it doesn't concern only the modern, let's say, uh, period, the socialist period, but uh, yeah, we have... Uh, a little bit uh, aggressive situation now towards uh, heritage because of uh, the development dyna dynamics, urban dynamics that uh, are characterizing uh, um, Albania. So there is this uh, huge desire to, uh, there is this huge pressure for coming from the constru construction industry. And uh, let's say that there is a very delicate situation for monuments of culture, but also the legal frame, uh, framework needs to be uh, worked. Uh, especially concerning the, um, the socialist period. Uh, as far as we know, there are a lot of unprotected, uh, in interesting uh, architectural uh, objects crafted during uh, the socialist period. So from this point of view, it's not a very good situation. And uh, another uh, topic is related to uh, the public reaction. reaction. Uh, you mentioned uh, after our presentation uh, the case of the National Theatre that uh, when demolished, uh, it is an important uh, uh, element to mention um, uh, because for the first time architectural debate went public uh, and uh, also there was uh, for the first for the first time um, public reaction uh, reaction but in terms yeah it didn't work but uh, yes it's important because yeah after the communism people do not believe that they have a voice in two processes so uh, yes uh, these are important facts in order to change somehow the the, the situation if you might may, may i add just two sentences i mean uh, uh, 
in Albania, the main problem we have is that the uh, average uh, cultural level of the politicians is lower than the average one of the population, and that's uh, uh, the main thing to deal with. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's the truth, but it's sad truth. And then we have a culture of rejection of the past. I mean, it's coming, it's a continuous thing coming from socialism, coming from isolation. So, uh, and Verhoja got so isolated, they created a culture of, uh, 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 that should be pr produced on its own and then uh, uh, leaving traces. So this model is being repeated and I think we are not fully detached from the socialism. Now, we're a democratic country, okay, based on elections, but we, we do not operate uh, fully on democratic rules. And that's a, a personal opinion. And the third thing is that uh, uh, communities of professionals uh, overestimate themselves uh, considering that what we say in these rooms okay, can be heard, but we are really very isolated, both in academia and both in uh, professional communities. So nobody is caring what we're talking about. And I mean, this is to, to put into simple words, but I mean, uh, that's the real problem we have with that. How are your wishes or your recommendations, or <laughs> how can we alter this situation? You, you know, the theater in, in Tirana, it was under the seven most endangered heritage sites of Europa Nostra. You cannot organize a better communication European-wide than Europa Nostra, and nevertheless, and it is, it's not of the re-Stalinist era of Enver Hoxha, yeah. it is the, uh, the first Stalinist era, and so we thought, uh, this is uh, clear, that, that is uh, a commitment of the international uh, community of, of heritage advisors and so on, and then they uh, de demolished it, so I am a little bit, it's a really f a f a failure. It's, uh, it's I, a I think the case of the theater is heat. not the, mo the most uh, important. I mean, uh, the stadium is much more important than the theater, but uh, most of the international community didn't hear about, because sporties do not protest like artists. So, I mean, uh, they, they didn't have a reaction. They just know how to play and they have a lot of fans, but uh, they can't protest for the stadium. And that's the real problem. I mean, uh, we, we, we're pushing into something that is really small in comparison to what is happening with heritage in Albania. Okay, thank you very much. I have one question left for Elena Dudova, but first of all, please, your question, because it was related I to... I don't know. Uh, my question is uh, to uh, Dr. Ivanovska Deskova. Uh, you've mentioned Doxiadis, and um, uh, actually today very few people uh, remember this, uh, this uh, guy, but uh, in fact he created more urban mass than, than all the, the modernists put together. Uh, I wonder uh, what was his reception in Macedonia? Was uh, acoustics popular among architects and city planners? Well, he was uh, one of the experts invited by the United Nations to participate in the Skopje planning process. He was much involved in this uh, part of the survey. So uh, actually the first, um, the first m maps uh, regarding the, the extent of damage and so on was done by Konstantinos Doxiadis and his team. And uh, it was much related to his study of uh, the suffering of Greece after the Second World War, his famous publication that was published a few years after the Second World War, where, where he very systematically mapped uh, all the, the sufferings for, uh, of different regions of Greece and uh, the loss in, in terms of uh, casualty but in, also in terms of crops in, in terms of uh, livestock and so on and so on and um, he, he was asked first to produce these this initial surveys for, for Skopje uh, and um, this was the first time that uh, for instance a uh, um, ma map of seismicity was done because Skopje is on seismical ground then they, they made huge economic cultural demographic graphic analysis before the, the planning process and later for, for the master plan because the master plan was actually divided between the Polish team, Pol service led by Adolf Siborowski and Doxiadis. Doxiadis did a, a housing study, how to produce uh, different typologies of houses in, for a very short period and in a very systematic way and uh, they were all later published within this master plan project. So I don't think it, it was actually that the local architects invited him, but he was already known on, a, on the international scene, and that's why he was invited to participate to Skopje. 
Thank you very much, um, Elena. I have one question left because in the in the abstract, which is also published here in this uh, in the program, you underlined the role of female architects and of civic society. And my question is, when we discuss this question of collaborative or of cooperative architecture, which is more or less anonymous, and the master architects and star architects and uh, heroes of architecture, is, isn't there a difference in the post-war period that until the 70s, the, the role of, uh, of uh, civic groups uh, and also of the women uh, in, in architecture was totally different from what happened after the European heritage here, for example, after 1975, when a new movement started, and then this aspect became a, a more and more relevant and was of more importance than before. Are there, aren't there two, let's say, uh, eras mm -hmm. in this question? Well, I would then, like in this case, I would maybe a little bit like differentiate between um, what was happening in the East and in the West. Because in the East, I didn't have time, but uh, uh, there were like these crucial legal reforms in the family and women were actually asked to come to work. So uh, it was just like a common policy. Um, whereas they could study still since like in Czechoslovakia, but in all Central Europe since 19. 18. So actually, the post-war period was like the first time when like women started really like to get in big larger numbers into uh, the profession, um, and they did have like stable uh, stable employment, meaning that they uh, if if they were like uh, you know on maternity leave and everything, there was like this collective they could get back to. Uh, and in spite of that, like and during our research, we found out that in spite of this, they had to wait like almost three decades to get to a leading position, which was actually like possible in these like social structures because they had like a stable like profession, but still it was like extremely complicated. I mean, some of them really. And uh, in the West, I would say, I mean, Beatrice Kolobina says that uh, like in the 50s and 60s, there was like more reception to like these like pairs like. Uh, Peter and Alison Smithson and uh, Ray um, and Charles Eames and, and so forth. But like um, with this like um, uh, neo, uh, neoliberal, uh, but, but on the other hand, like the, the, this like turn to like more like uh, this Cold War um, era that like the authorship and individualism was more like um, supported. Uh, in the West, uh, in order to make the make the difference to to the Eastern sort of social model, um, yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, Dennis Scott Brown, she she wrote this like a uh, uh, text like "Sexism on the Top" or something like that, and <laughs> I can't remember like the specific uh, name, but actually she was she's like there like very uh, very precisely. Uh, speaking about how she was always entitled just a wife, uh, architect's wife, and like I mean, um, and and she was not like invited to actually architect's dinners because she was just a wife, and like uh, like on a on a regular basis, like uh, articles were attributed only to Venturi, even if he stated clearly um, that she is the co-author, and like the Pritzker Prize was also like dedicated only to Venturi, whereas it was not a problem to dedicate it to Herzog and de Merol. So I mean, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, I think it, the position of, of women is was not not so easy. Um, so so that's what actually brought me uh, to like think about like how the discourse and this canonization actually works. Because it's it's somehow like a very like biography and uh, like this architect genius centered and like usually the work trajectories of women do not uh, have this like very linear uh, evolution. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I do not see any hand or signal, so there are no more questions. Comments up. <laughs> you are invited. Uh, thank you. I can start off well. <coughs> I would like to come back to this oral history question because this is quite striking when speaking about uh, research in, on architecture history and uh, yeah, uh, we have quite a lot of experiences with oral history and sometimes 
it is really necessary to confront it with the different sources because as we <laughs> know, uh, architects are very good narrators and uh, yeah, so I, I would like to um, to know what was your uh, methodology, how you how you <laughs> actually uh, did it with uh, these corrections or or on. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, first, my general uh, idea was that, except from the very, very objective facts, like, I don't know, names, dates, places, and so on, uh, everyone has the right to have its own truth. So there is no, there is no false and truth. But uh, all of those people I interviewed, they had uh, their own right. Of course, uh, when, for example, uh, Stefan Miller, I mentioned in the presentation, uh, told me about uh, the fact that he uh, had uh, contact with the Western world only through the journals. Uh, I checked his uh, data in the archive and uh, it appeared that he had a passport and he visited uh, foreign countries, also Western Europe. So, well, uh, his version of the history is somehow uh, wrong. But I asked the question why he remembered it that way? Because it's also important. It's also important because sometimes architects uh, presented uh, some, let's say, uh, histories taken from the journals, from books, as their own memories. So it's not only about architects, of course, it's generally the idea of memory, of collective memory, individual memory. So, uh, well, when uh, there was a big gap, big difference between one version and another, in my uh, work, in my book, because I published uh, recently a book about it, uh, I confronted them, but uh, sometimes as uh, two versions of the same history, sometimes uh, as just my small note uh, at the bottom of the, of the page as a footnote. Uh, but generally, uh, I, my starting point was that everyone has uh, his, her own right to his, her own version of the history, because it's about the memory not really about the uh, truth. Thank you very much, Darius. Yes, I think uh, this question goes to uh, Helena Dodova uh, because, uh, you know, uh, I wonder if you've made a kind of a comparison between the organization models of different socialist countries, not the socialist and Western, uh, because, uh, for instance, myself as a young architect in a, in a kind of, a, in quotation mark, faceless, gray, uh, bureaucratic office, there was this uh, system of ateliers with the masters, with the masters who could delegate their young uh, apprentices into a master school and so on. So it, the, this kind of tradition of almost a kind of bazaar like tradition of the atelier, the master and the apprentice survived very well. But I wonder whether it's true also, also for other, you know, socialist countries. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I was also like asking about this and this is quite unresearched. Actually, like at, until now, there was like this uh, major research project uh, by uh, Harald Engler, uh, which was like a DFG project, uh, and and the result is this book called Das Kollektiv, and then there is like a one one symposium study, and and then there was like this one. Uh, so the, the GDR is by far the best research. There is one uh, one more book by Tobias Servos known something like the architect in the GDR or something like that. But like uh, in Prague now, there is only like this research on this like Stavo project uh, first era, like 49 to 53 starting. And, and I have to say that only like due to like my general historical knowledge, I was actually able to reconstruct like this, this complete structure, but still like this, uh, like how these offices worked um, is quite like for for uh, for for general audience, I mean, it, it's it's very like completely blurred, and it's also the the case for different countries. I received some information from Hungary, 
um, and there were like different uh, different roles of like different uh, types of offices like during different times. I don't know. I, I, and then sometimes like the, for instance, uh, the texts are only in Hungarian, so I managed to translate some, but not. But I also understood that at some moment, for instance, the uh, the. Like in the 50s and 60s, like the industrial architecture was, for instance, promoted, and there were also like women going to these like industrial uh, like planning offices, you know, and uh, and that um, um, yeah, and and then and then also like the structures were different, like like in the GDR there were like these combinate, and the architects offices were part of these like combinate, whereas uh, whereas in in Czechoslovakia there was like a separate planning office, and then there was like the separate uh, sort of industrial plan. So like uh, it, there is like a lot of influences, and, and these like organization models uh, don't like that you could like really compare it doesn't don't exist. So I could like only take up like fragmentary cases because uh, yeah because it's it's like very many different languages and the start, the research is still in progress thank you very much um, in front of me the clock they, it shows that there are I have a zero minutes left now sorry <laughs> i have so a, uh, i have really okay i have uh, one and short question because um, uh, Many of speeches concern uh, and, and uh, describe impulses from the West uh, on the East and observe uh, dialogue between uh, Western architecture and, and Eastern form. And I think about such a situation, uh, maybe it is not true. Uh, is it possible that uh, this impulse may be Essential um, uh, come uh, come from from the Soviet so Soviet uh, uh, direction, and the kind of uh, modernism as a linear system of Oskar Hansen was very similar to the, uh, some 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 development of the system in the in the in the Russia uh, in the Soviet Russia is it possible that we may complicate this picture between east and west thank you very much for this uh, question maybe this is the final round it's especially for you i think thank you that's an interesting question and uh, my response would be to even more uh, complicate the things and to just uh, notice that people uh, come up with uh, similar ideas uh, despite the fact that some are aware of uh, their own uh, uh, importance of the work and just like humanity came up with the idea of a bow separately separated on uh, individual uh, cultures uh, so the ideas in the modernist architecture uh, appeared in uh, some kind of a random manner, uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, of course, we are uh, familiar with the concepts such as uh, stolen works by Le Corbusier, uh, which were, uh, in a way, a copy of Narconfil uh, built in Bolshevik Russia. Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, the new aesthetics of the architecture, of a new architecture uh, in, his, in the half of the second, uh, on the 20th century, uh, held similar aesthetics and it was also justified in an example of Albania who was not supposed to be modernist and yet there it is uh, coming out uh, coming out with the ideas that can be recognized as a modernist itself so perhaps uh, your your question is uh, is there any because we were talking about uh, eastern influence on the west and western eastern uh, Perhaps the Oscar Hansen would be a milestone in this discussion because uh, his uh, discussion about the open and closed form uh, materialized in a modernism in a very interesting way. For example, uh, he lived in a time that the city Brasilia was uh, designed and built by Oscar de Marier in uh, Brazil. Uh, quite radical, politically uh, speaking, uh, background which allowed the Oscar Niemeyer to actually uh, come up with the ideas that could be realized in East, but they weren't, even in the Soviet Union, for example. Uh, and yet Oscar Hansen uh, claimed that uh, the city Brasilia, experimental city, is going to become an antique because it is even finished. I suppose that's all, thank you.
uh, one uh, thing more concerning uh, your question. Uh, when we are talking about, for example, Polish architecture after World War II, we have different periods. When we analyze the most important journal, uh, Architectura, uh, we have uh, years uh, 1949-1956, when there are only Polish and Soviet projects presented. Uh, but then, after 1956, uh, mostly Western. So uh, I uh, believe that Polish architects after World War II were really, really uh, focused on what was going on on the Western part of the Iron Curtain. And uh, they even uh, didn't want to admit, for example, that the Malevich or constructivist movement inspired them. Before the World War II, Malevich was an important person, and those contacts with East were uh, present concerning the architectural avant-garde after World War II, during the times of socialism. Uh, really hardly any architect admitted that he was even familiar with what was going on uh, uh, on the other side of eastern border of Poland. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the speakers and to the co-speakers and to the co-authors, also to those who are not here yet. Uh, thank you very much to the audience, to your uh, uh, statements and, and questions. And now I will get, hand over the microphone to the hosts, Ben Bushfeld, or you, you are. <laughs> thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, this is a time for a coffee break, yeah, or, or for the uh, applause or so. Yeah.